Anthony. I will be the moderator for today's panel. Uh, I'm also a member of the Theorizing the Web Committee, and I also do the Treasury stuff, so if I owe you money, come find me later. <laughs> or don't find me, that'd be great. First off, I want to thank you all for having impeccable taste and picking one of the best panels, I think, today, because I'm moderating it, so maybe I'm a little biased. But I definitely think this is very good. I also want to give a big shout out to our live stream people. Uh, glad you could be with us today. So it's going to be a really fun panel, Post-Human Nature which is something I think we're all thinking about and concerned about. It is definitely on the lips of so many people. And today's panelists are going to be bringing you some really interesting perspectives that look at this question from angles you may never really considered before. So it's going to be a really fun time. I want you to pay attention and listen to what they got to say. We're going to have question and answering at the end. So save all of the fun things you want to have. Be sure to write them down because I know I forget questions pretty quick. I'll hear something good and I won't be able to keep it later. So you know, be sure to save time and write it down. So I guess we'll just go. Do you guys want to just do how we have it on the program here? We'll go through that order. Is that cool? Great. So the first presentation we're going to have is Type Amen, if you believe, Embodied Belief and the Digital Mediation of Religious Fervor. This is going to be presented by Anna Marie O'Brien and Morgan Morell. And then with that, I'm going to take it off and let them uh, get up here and talk. Hi everybody, I'm Anna O'Brien and I'm a doctoral candidate in American Studies at Penn State University. I study uh, visual culture and internet culture as well as folklore. Um, so I have uh, been studying a lot of different topics including um, New Age religious practices online. Um, and so this sort of led me to um, this topic that we're looking at today. Uh, my name is Morgan Oscar Morell. I um, studied media arts and then got a master's of science and information in information preservation. Um, now I work at a digitization vendor and we digitize at risk media, AV media for cultural heritage institutions. Um, and so I'm taking a communications approach really. Uh, so this is a prayer post up here, a prayer petition post as we call them, type amen, something good will happen. Um, or something bad won't happen. Uh, we first noticed prayer posts appearing in our feeds and didn't really think much of them because like popular image macros tend to, they come and go and get shared by distant friends and relatives, people you don't forget, you don't remember being friends with. But then our interest began to rise as the image in, images became more demented, depraved, graphic, and didactic, and parodies and haters started appearing. And as they say, you know you've made it when you've got haters. So... Um, seeking more information and having researched New Age uh, religious practices, we began uh, researching the topic and collecting prayer posts as we found them. Um, all of the images that you see here are, uh, for the most part, screenshots um, from either Facebook or Instagram. Um, so this presentation is about forming a framework for approaching prayer posts as images that represent new communi communicative expressions of religious belief. So um, our main question that we had when we were looking at these um, is what is it about the encounter with prayer posts that allows it to c carry religious weight for users? Why do people share them? And why do people continue to like them and say amen at them? Um, so uh, I'm going to be talking about prayer posts as an example of vernacular religious belief. And I'm not sure if there's any folklorists in the audience here, but this is a concept that is fairly central to the study of beliefs by scholars who don't want to be dismissive of the subjective experiences and values of the people they're studying. Folklorists, however, have been hesitant to approach new media traditions as, as folklore as they are new, still, relatively. So uh, folklore has been defined many ways, but one of the most useful and short definitions comes from Dahlheims in 1974. According to Himes, folklore is the study of communicative behavior with an aesthetic, expressive, or stylistic dimension. Vernacular religion is a term used to refer to the way that religion is lived in everyday life. It implies the existence of an institutional religion toward which it is arranged or opposed. Folklore is seeking to expand disciplinary boundaries to include contemporary and more broad religious practices, um, ranging from ritual and performance to jokes and chores, focus on these practices that emerge from the bottom upward. Um, the vernacular is distinct from religious institutions that have a central agent that imposes its beliefs and practices, as in the case of the Pope issuing a decree like the one pictured here in the 1960s outlining the church's stance on birth control. 
However, Catholicism, like any other religion, is rife with vernacular practices, like, for instance, prayers to saints for specific favors, yard altars, and tattoos like this Guadalupe piece on Justin Bieber's forearm. Um, So uh, people were uh, folklorists, however, have um, been concerned with how newer media forms affect um, the practice of these religions. There are fears about the rise of mass media and industrialization and the alienation of of folk practice with very real consequences. The consumption and commodification of folk tradition negates some of the important social functions as well as some of the localization of tradition to communities, according to some scholars. However, as early as the 1950s, um, Adorno began to question this assumption, finding that the anti-rationalisms of New Age cults, religious fundamentalisms, in his words, were developing with and actively engaged in developments in communicative technologies. More recently, Robert Howard's examination of vernacular Christianity online found that the emergent technologies have resulted in a more voluntaristic attitude towards spiritual involvement, allowing religious commitment to be more individualized. Um, This here is a screenshot from an active... Christian, um, fundamentalist Christian website. Um, And you can see here um, that generally it's, so these beliefs here that he describes um, in his book are um, generally agreed to be communicated um, through many individuals over time um, with a vernacular authority rather than institutional um, decrees. So uh, there's been a reemergence as well, or continuation of um, so-called occult beliefs in modern American society that has generated a lot of speculation as well, as it appears to contradict our conception of the contemporary world as hyper-rational or scientific in orientation. And this is a screenshot from a um, astrology website that is very old school, but still up. Um, so While vernacular religion is often problematic to religious officials who seek to discipline a belief system, it is also problematic for skeptics who consider many of the practices to be primitive superstition. So we see some ambivalent reactions popping up. Um, Someone who may be irreligious may share these sort of skeptical posts with the deformed goldfish, um, doubting the intervention of spirits, while other religious users may critique the message or or the mode of transmission. Um, as in this one here, this user sometimes does share prayer posts as well, so or religious posts. Um, so this I wanted to compare to previous forms of mediated contact or um, the use of the phrase point of contact, which is a term that's used by Pentecostal and other Christian denominations to refer to the use of a material object as a way of involving your tactile um, sensations with the ineffable. So it emerged as a prominent tradition in the 19th and 20th centuries, um, sometimes anointed with oils. um, It involved the circulation of cloth material. A woman in Kansas may get word that her granddaughter in New York is ill and in need of healing. Um, She prays over a cloth and then mails it. The granddaughter then sleeps with it or um, prays or meditates over it, and and it relieves some sort of healing powers. Um, Using one of the central modes of transmission available at the time, the Postal Service, prayer cloths were sent to people in need of healing across the United States. Once they were picked up as a service from institutions, there was often regulation of the size and shape to fit typical envelopes and mail requirements. The qualities of the cloth, its tangibility and materiality, the way the cloth functions as a sign of domesticity and comfort are all part of its meaning and function. Um, And it's considered to be formative in the formation of charismatic Protestant churches that uh, were considering themselves independent from larger traditions. Another um, ig- another previous tradition that uses the idea of points of contact that can be applicable to prayer posts is the idea of holy cards. So these were um, portable expressions of a kind of direct line, in the words of uh, George and Salvatore, to the divine. Um, these have material, visual, and textual qualities as well that add to their um, potential for representing religious belief. Um, And I want to emphasize that they were also um, very personal and sort of private in terms of their use. However, they were also gifted. You generally didn't buy your own prayer card. You would receive it as a gift from somebody else. Um, And then a a third mediated form of points of contact that we looked at was the radio. So in the 1940s, Oral Roberts emerged as a prominent religious voice through the use of radio broadcasting. 
Roberts mitigated the lack of audience interaction and feedback associated with mass media communication by encouraging his listeners to lay their hands upon their radios. The vibration of the sound waves from the speaker into the chassis of the radio transmitted a tactile and haptic sensation into the body of the audience while maintaining the ephemeral and contemporaneous reach afforded by broadcast media. So, um, and I had a video and didn't quite get it to work, but uh, Earl Roberts talks about the point of contact in front of a large crowd of people during a television broadcast and at one point puts his hand up and implores a user to put their hand up against his and it's quite harrowing experience to imagine a bunch of people across the country putting their hands up against their television. Um, so aspects like these three religious traditions can be seen in prayer posts. Like prayer cloths, prayer posts are often imbued with healing intentions, representing personal miracles and person-to-person -person communications. So pray and this person, uh, you know, picture of an injured child and pray so this child can get healed. Um, as with holy cards, prayer posts use popular imagery and visual symbols to enhance the intimacy of the experience. And as with radio broadcasts, prayer posts are ephemeral experiences. The user sees them, reacts, and then moves on. Their wide reach is also enabled by technological infrastructure and networks. And further with the, radio, with the haptic feedback, I, we just like that word because when you like something and your phone vibrates, you're having that haptic response on your phone. So there's sort of this word play that continues as well. So as a point of contrast to that, not all religious use of broadcast infrastructure attempts to enhance the feedback between the source and the receiver even within the realm of new media when feedback is often built into that system. So Pope Francis's YouTube channel interprets YouTube's term channel skeuomorphically, relying on the traditional broadcast television concept of a channel by severing the feedback loop between the audience and the, and the creator. Viewers are provided the typical YouTube comment submission form under each video, but comments that are, are made private and so you type in a comment and immediately disappears and doesn't show up to other users. So in any communication system you have noise and the noise is part of the signal that isn't part of the intended message so by removing the audience participation institutional sources can mitigate a powerful source of noise and keep it from polluting or, or dulling the signal and its interpretation by other audience members by encouraging audience participation and sharing Prayer posts may provide a new way of considering that noise as formative in the belief which is a vital human experience and the points of contact with the ineffable in the examination of prayer posts, we may find many marks of vernacular culture. We're going to examine the features of prayer posts in relation to the criteria of vernacular culture. So uh, prayer posts often have unclear collective authorship. So authorship of images is often omitted and others it may be co purposely made unclear. Copyrighted image with tons of watermarks can be found, so the images were pulled from somewhere else. Some prayer posts contain multiple watermarks, marred watermarks, or obscured watermarks, and this could serve to detach the message from any particular individual, relieving the audience of an anxiety that it may be, they may be praying to an individual or to an image rather than the word of God. In these cases, the creators of the content function as a channel of the message rather than the source of the message. Uh, many prayer posts contain reappropriations or reworking of existing popular and religious imagery. So minions are those guys that we love, that we love you know, love those guys. They, they lack any inherent meaning themselves, and they allow the creators to imbue them with their own meaning, and the audience then can decode their own personal interpretations from them. Uh, other religious imagery can be reworked to further include and connect previously marginalized social groups or ethnicities. Uh, and also sometimes you'll find images from movies that have um, there's one image of Harvey Dent in the hospital with his face all marred and it says like this man was in a fire please pray for him um, and in this case um, you're finding narratives superimposed upon culturally important images and culturally known images in this case uh, the, where the image comes from like there the, the image has mutability it no longer means what it used to mean and people can project their own narratives and the narratives that people are projecting and the narratives that people are taking from them are really what's important in that case all right, I gotta cut you all off that was 12 minutes uh -huh. Thanks. <laughs> if you have other questions, please, I know you're kind of a professional. So you questions, I know people love to talk about what they present here, so they're totally love it. So don't be embarrassed, go ask them lots of interesting things. All right, we're going to move on to panel two, or number two here. All right, so the second one's going to be by um, Carmel Weissman. She's going to come up and talk to you today about Forget What You Know About Disability, How Cyborg and Transhuman Discourses Are Reconfiguring Disability. Don't start the count. Don't start the no, count. No. Don't start the count. <laughs> <laughs> Till I find the PowerPoint. Okay. OK. 
Okay, so I want to talk to you today about the future. When we think about the future, both critical theory and uh, dystopian sci-fi point our concerns towards one goal, question of access. What if only the rich will be able to access technologies, advanced technologies? What if the rest of society would be left behind? And this is what we think about when we think about the future at least in the media imagery. But in reality, the first social group that actually gets access to mind-boggling technology, like mind-controlled drones or transgressive technologies and advanced prosthetics, are not the rich, but the disabled. People with disabilities are the ones who are actually embodying already some cyborgian and transhuman uh, practices and aesthetics in public via NGOs such as Robots for Humanity or countless hackathons that aim at hacking disability. So this is something that I want to do as a provocation today. I want to postulate this future in which we don't have this type of imagery in the media that much. What will happen if this is actually the social group that will have access to advanced technology? What kind of society is that? So I, I want to start with a short definition of, of what is a human, what is, what is a human being. So in scholarship, a human being is actually defined according to a very particular spectrum of abilities. If you have less than those abilities, then you're less than human. If you have more abilities, then you're more than human. So this is how it works. Now, when you look at research on people with disabilities, um, Usually, their representations in the media are very polarized. In research, you see that they are either presented in movies and ads as less than human, the miserable, angry, evil, cripple, a burden on society, everybody waits for them to die in the movie. Not saying that. Oliver is saying that, right? Or the other way around. You have those narratives of the superhuman and overcoming of the disability, doing extraordinary things, going beyond human achievements to... Um, go beyond your disability. And when, when you talk to people with disabilities, all they tell you that they want, they're angry about those representations, all they tell the researchers is, we just want to be represented as part of the human spectrum. We want to be considered part of the human diversity, we want to be normal, not more than, not less than. What's the role of technology in this? So when you think about technology for disabilities, technology discourses were always about normalization, cure, rehabilitation. This is something that helps you level up with this level of normality to be part of human diversity, have those abilities level up. And even now when you have those new discourses of cyborg aesthetics and transhuman technologies, disability scholars are very um, suspicious towards those discourses. They see it as a rejection of the body, including the disabled body, and this obligation to fix thyself is something that is viewed as a form of negative eugenics. So people with disabilities want to be normal, but they don't want to do something in order to fit in, you know, to fix themselves in order to cut it. So um, in Israel, which is where I'm from, uh, a couple of uh, years ago, too much noise. Uh, a decade ago, there was a really interesting attack by an Iranian technology. So it's trying to show all those uh, um, um, wheelchairs and canes and prosthetics as something that is not just signifiers of sickness and weakness. It could be sexy fashion accessories. And it was just a drop in the, in the ocean of disability prejudice. But it seems that a decade later, those cyborg uh, discourses in the media are actually helping to rebrand disability technologies. Those discourses are re-enchanting technologies, and this includes media technologies and uh, disability technology, sorry. And with this comes a new generation of celebrities that don't want anymore just to cut it as normal, just appear like part of human diversity. They want to be more. They don't mind standing out anymore. They don't want to stand along with everyone else. So Oscar Pistorius, uh, the athlete called uh, the Blade Runner, actually owns a pair of those normal-looking legs, but this is not what makes him into a very unique new kind of sex symbol. A psychologist Bertolt Mayer, uh, the blueprint for the first bionic man, has an advanced prosthetic 
uh, that is actually built for a robot and uh, you know he doesn't need this kind of plastic hand that does everything the human hand does when you can have a hand that actually turns for cycle does party tricks this is cooler um, artist Neil Harbison was born with a rare inability to see color and now he has this antenna connected to his brain that translates color for him to music and so he tells that at the beginning he just wanted you know to be normal to understand the world of color to to have this ability to understand color through a different modality but then his appetite grew he wanted to see more colors than humans see so he now can hear see infrared ultraviolet and he calls himself openly a cyborg and advocates for having more abilities for everyone so this is just a, a, a a few examples of celebrities from this generation, but the interesting thing is that the non-famous follow now. So a lot, you, you hear a lot of new voices, like this one from France, for example. They said, okay, now you're going to have this. I was very disappointed. And I was thinking, come on, you're making Terminator movies, you're making science fiction movies, and this is all you have to me? So we downloaded files, open source files, on the internet. We made a hand with a 3D printer, and this is how I see my disability now. So it's completely different. And this is completely different now because you know it seems that more and more voices in the uh, in the community of people with disabilities are actually um, liking this idea of standing out with something cool, being cyborgs, and. Um, what, what happens here is that the entire of humanity doesn't have the dream about being a better human anymore. We all dream about being more than human. And even the social groups who wanted to cut it as regular humans to begin with are having access now to this dream. And you know what? They actually have an advantage in getting there before all of us. Having a disability from a human perspective could be a gateway to a, a more enhanced ability from a post-human perspective. Think, for example, of disabilities such as autism and Asperger, which reportedly are um, in very high levels in uh, Silicon Valley. Now, from a, a, from a human perspective, this might hinder a bit um, social relations, but from a post-human perspective, maybe it's better for mediated, mediated relations, maybe it's more machine compatible, maybe you're thinking more like a machine. So the future might be something that people with disabilities will have uh, an advantage and greater access to. Uh, I borrowed my talk's title today from artist, uh, uh, from the first cyborg pop singer, Victoria Modesta, that actually charts a course to this future. This is her debut video called Prototype, just a part of it. sees a new representation on the media with disability and then she would um, end up uh, amputating her her doll because of this so this is a, a, a new type of uh, representation of what such a future society could look like because this future and the words of the song is about this is the future with li with limitless um, so this is a type of future in which what was formerly called as disability, forget what you knew about disability, is actually the new cool, sexy thing, like a pointy um, leg that uh, shine, that glows, right? So what, what will happen in such a future? Will people, um, healthy, formerly known as normal human people, would want to maybe hurt themselves, amputate themselves in order to get access? to those new technologies? This is a question that we should think about. This is already teased in some uh, fringe geeky texts like Dragon Ball Z. And in Modesta's video, also there's a fan that amputates himself in order to uh, be like Victoria. So this is, this is one possibility that we, we should think of. And in Israel, we had an interesting case of a war veteran named Eitan Chermon that had a, um, he had an injury and he uh, had to have a, 
small disability in his leg. And then he said, you know what? I don't want to have the small disability. Cut the leg, cut all the leg, and then, you know, cut half the leg. And then I could have a Blade Runner like Oscar Pistorius. And then I'll, I'll at least be an athlete. And now he's going to the Olympics and everything. And he, he's a famous speaker, tells his story of how he chose a greater disability in order to have this enhanced ability and to the amazement of, of his doctors that could save the leg. So maybe we're looking into such a future. There are a few more possibilities of, of such a future. There are mo more questions to, to postulate in such a future when the new elite, the leading elite of the future would not be the rich people, but the people that today are, uh, have disabilities. What, kind, what happens to a social group that was marginalized? How will they treat the people, uh, the, the mainstream people who just Mistreated them, uh, mistreated them until recently? Uh, will this elite that has a unique perspective on humanity have a more, a better um, vision for post-humanity, for a post-human society? So I, I don't have answers, but there are a few, um, there are a few media texts, a few sci-fi texts that, that help us postulate those ideas. What I want to sum up with is something that comes not from media texts, but from social reality. In social reality, it seems that although cyborg is cool and everybody wants to be a cyborg and thinks about cyborging, um, when, when cyborg aesthetics is embodied in public, people don't actually receive it that well. And I'm not talking only about people attacking people that walk around with Google Glass, but it seems that we like our cyborgs in, in, self, in safe distance in the media and not on the street. Artists and uh, people with disabilities that actually have embedded prosthetics have suffered uh, um, attacks in the street. This is Steve Munn, the father of wearable computing, and uh, he had a famous... Um, and he had a, several attacks, but the famous one in McDonald's, people try to rip uh, his electronic eye out of him. And uh, Neil Harbison also uh, uh, suffered s similar attacks. And what I think that the future last 30 seconds, I think that we should think about a future, sociologically speaking, in which the elite will not be the privileged. The elite would be the one at risk, a vulnerable elite that would, would lead us into a new uh, uh, evolutionary future in which they would take the risk of evolution. So it's a totally different sociology for such a future. And this was just a provocation. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to, if you can approach me later, I'm looking forward to hear what you have to say about this. New thoughts. That's all. Thank you. All right, we're going to keep the conversation moving along. Next up, we have Minka Stoyanova. She's presenting on 21st Century Feminism is Cyborgism. Hello. Ooh. Ooh. Why is it not there? It'll appear on the screen. You're good. It will? Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> Magic. Um, yeah, so, I'm Mika Stoyanova. I'm from the City University of Hong Kong School of Creative Media. Um, I'm actually loving following that last talk because that's kind of my entry point is as we move forward and as we become more cyborg, there are these serious legal questions about our bodily autonomy, what aspects of technology can be taken away from us that we have to consider. For me specifically, I actually look at cyborg readings of contemporary art, but I found that in trying to establish that, I really needed to establish a foundational model for the cyborg as a way of looking at kind of everyone right now. So. In order to do that, I mean, of course, I immediately went back to kind of where the beginning of the cyborg as theory, not necessarily the cyborg as a scientific possibility, but as a theoretical tool. And here we're at Donna Haraway's Manifesto for Cyborgs. I promise all of my slides are not this text heavy, and I'm not going to like just, I don't even expect you to read that if you don't want to. 
But like starting with Donna Haraway, what she was trying to do is look at the cyborg as a model for feminism. So she was looking both at the problems of a gender binary, but also the problems of an increasingly fractured feminism and trying to create a model which would allow all of those things to come together into some sort of single melded identity. So in thinking about that, I don't really want to do the cyborg as the model for feminism, because that for me is not really where we're going. I'm thinking, how do I model the cyborg itself? So maybe I can reverse that. Maybe I can flip that and instead use feminism's understanding now of gender as a model for the cyborg itself. <clears throat> so in doing that, um, I want to look at three perspectives on gender that I think we've kind of internalized in feminism at this point. The first and the kind of the most important one that I'm going to spend the most time on is the idea of gender as a state of becoming and a constantly re-evaluated state. And then secondarily and tertiarily, the, um, the performance of gender and also the consistency between the material reality of gender and gender as a social construct and how we navigate that. So Judith Butler starts from Simone de Beauvoir's that a woman is not born but is, is in a state of constant becoming. So there's this constant idea in feminism that we are always defining ourselves as wherever our gender sits. It's a term and a process is the, how Butler takes that. So what I would like to consider is that maybe if we flip that, a cyborg is not born, but is a process of becoming. And that this is then driven also again by social norms and social mores, et cetera. So then how do we actually apply this idea of becoming in the sense of our conceptions of ourselves as cyborgs. So here I want to look at the many theorists that start to talk about the individual or the human as a complex system and as a system which is defined by the relations that exist within the individual. So there we're looking at things like Maturana's autopoiesis and structural couplings, but also Gilbert Simondon's concepts of concretization of the technical object, where if you then take that into like Bernard Stiegler's transindividuation, where I, as the physical, like the human part, organic part of me, and all of my technological parts of me are indivisible, right? We're constantly feeding each other. My technology gives me certain inputs which define me, and then I then mediate my experience through my technology, and that creates a feedback loop which creates a system around me which is indistinguishable. And that's always changing, right? I'm always bringing in new technologies. This is always modifying itself, and it's not something which is like a static definition. Oh, how is it the same one? I'm so confused. There we go. All right. So the other part of this that Judith Butler brings in is this idea of a genealogy or the way in which this is socially constructed. So how does like social mores and social norms then define gender? So we're constantly, I mean, obviously we know that gender 50 years ago was defined differently than gender now. And I think that that same thing we can see within the definition of the cyborg. So looking at actual examples, but also, I mean, we, we look at theorists like Andy Clark or Chris Hables Gray, there is this idea that we've always been cyborg, that cyborg is an essential component of us as humans. The integration of technology into ourselves and into our societies is what makes us human, if anything. So then to look at these examples, one would think like, for instance, glasses, like I wear glasses, I think about glasses a lot. Um, of course, there was a time when, a, when glasses would be like a radical cyborg intervention that completely changes the way that I see the world. And to some way, like they're normalizing, but I actually get glasses that are of a higher prescription than I need because I like to see better than normal. 
that's okay. Um, but then if we consider how that actually moves forward, like now we're in a stage where we have cochlear implants and that's becoming very normalized. And I know that when I had, when I used to babysit for a child who had a really early cochlear implant, I looked at that as being like crazy cyborg weird. But at this point, as that becomes more and more norm, like in the world, it becomes less and less cyborg. So someone doesn't necessarily view me as a cyborg for wearing glasses. And maybe in 10 years, somebody won't view that kid as being in any way, shape or form cyborg for their having their cochlear implant. That will just be considered a natural part of an, a person that happens to have been born with less hearing ability than other people. Um, and so then taking that even forward, this is where we look at like perhaps like memory devices. So this is an image from Black Mirror where in like a possible potential future, we're recording all of our memories and then that becomes the next cyborg enhancement. Maybe somebody who has trouble remembering or is born with an inability to remember then has a memory implant device and that becomes just as normalized as say my glasses or cochlear implants. So that's one way in which social mores and social norms define what, how we define ourselves as cyborg. The other example that I want to look at, though, is that our cyborgness is also defined by being a functional member of a community. So if we consider like a microscope and the scientist in the microscope as a unit, as a cyborg unit, we understand that a, a scientist who's like looking through a microscope cannot be a scientist without that microscope. So that microscope not only is a cyborg enhancement for the scientist, but it's also what allows him to be in his community because without the ability to see at that level, he is not a scientist. So it allows him to define himself socially within the community that he's in. So those are the two areas of becoming that I really wanted to talk about. Now I want to move a little bit into performance as the other, another way of looking at this relationship between gender and the cyborg and gender as a model for our understanding of being cyborg. So Judith Butler really looks into the idea that gender is performed. And gender is performed both in the way that it is enacted, i.e. like when I am enacting my gender, I am performing gender, but not necessarily that I am performing something which was prescribed before, but that I am always performing it, like that I perform my identity. Um, but then there is also this second way in which you are performing something which is normalized in a community. So if we think about that from the cyborg perspective, um, first of all, I, when I engage through technological means, I am performing myself as cyborg. So by wearing my glasses or whatever, I am performing my cyborgness. But I also, my technological press prostheses or my technological mediated, mediation tools allow me to perform cyborg through them. So I become cyborg because I have to perform my identity through these technical mediating devices. And then the third part is, and I think that this is very difficult when we think about ourselves as cyborgs and it's also very difficult for gender, and I think this is a really interesting analogous relationship here, is the idea of a material reality and a social con construct. So in gender, this maybe becomes the relationship between a biological sex and a socially defined gender. So Butler tries to decouple them, that becomes really problematic because we have people who psychologically or culturally don't want necessarily to decouple their biological sex and their gender. When we have like, when we start talking about like trans issues and trans rights, we want people to be able to make a consistency there if they want it. So in terms of defining how those things are related, we know that like they're not necessarily related, but consistency should always be potential. It should always be possible. So we bring this in to the realm of the cyborg and we can start to think about these ideas of when we think about the cyborg, we're always making these distinctions between the cyborg as like something which is actually embodied or something which is actually in me versus something which is external to me. So 
if I embed the Google Glass in my eyeball, is it more a part of me than if it's on my glasses? And like, it's not, of course. And like, I, I can start to create my own vision of myself as a cyborg in a consistent way through the way that I embody devices and or choose not to embody devices. So I think that this is the one that's really fruitful for a lot more playing in this area of where, where is the cyborg and how do we define the cyborg and how do we move forward in both a legal sense, but also in a defining of how we talk about ourselves as cyborgs. So in conclusion, Basically, what I've been trying to do here is take our 21st century concept of feminism-based gender and flip that, apply it again back to cyborg as a potential model for how we consider ourselves as cyborgs, as an aspect of our techno-socially constructed identity. So in the same way that gender does not define me, but is one aspect of me, so also is my cyborgness and how I define my cyborgness. All right. Rounding out our excellent panel so far, I think everybody's done a great job. I know time constraints are super fun, but everybody's done really great. So the last one we have, and then we're going to have a, a good amount of time for question answering, which I find to be the most exciting part of the presentation. It's where the rubber hits the road, so to speak, and we get to hear everybody else's views. So I hope you got lots of great questions. But our last presentation today is actually the product of three different writers, and I will introduce them all. We have Jonathan Pickens, who I've been told is in the audience. Jonathan, you want to raise your hand? There's Jonathan. We also have Kristen Gillespie Lynch. She is also here. And then presenting today will be Dave Shane Smith. And together, they put together a presentation titled The Ever-Shrinking World, Neurodiversity Encounters, Filter Bubbles. Sorry, that probably was... There's no pause between filter bubbles. You, you got the time. <laughs> All right. Hang on one sec. Let me X out of her stuff. Move on here. Oh, you can, you can post questions. Cool. Thank you. Okay. I'm David. Hi. Um, so this is called The Ever-Shrinking World. Like you said, Neurodiversity Encounters Filter Bubbles. Um, it's, uh, it's about the, some of the issues autistics are going to find when trying to express themselves and their identities online. Um, and uh, a couple quick things. Everybody knows the, uh, the web is offering an unprecedented accessibility of information. It's uh, got the ability to uh, let you interact with almost anyone. You'll be exposed to new ideas, hopefully. Uh, some potential catches with this uh, are one thing, filter bubbles, as described by Eli Pariser. It's one of his main concerns. And a cultural theorist named Byung-Chul Han out of uh, Berlin who's worried that everybody's just expressing themselves and only interacting with things that they're really interested in so that it forms almost kind of like a narcissism in uh, the individual and in a society. Eli Pariser, a little background, he's the CEO of Upworthy. He started moveon.org, and uh, he's an internet activist with these uh, filter bubble algorithms, personalization algorithms as his main kind of activist bent. Um, so he, he thinks web personalization algorithms are shaping the received content that we receive. If I Google something, you Google something, stuff we've clicked on in the past is going to affect our search results, and this might uh, limit our exposure to new ideas. And this uh, dismantles the public sphere for him because content is coming at individuals instead of uh, groups. Um, I'm going to get different information than you will. Byung Chul Han, I illustrated him this way. Because he kind of comes off to me as kind of a dark character and sort of like the Lenin to Paris or his McCartney in a sense, I guess. He's very extremely skeptical of the way we're talking to each other and becoming as a culture with digital communication and the internet. He, um, his top three concerns on his Wikipedia page are labeled burnout, depression, and internet. And I thought that was really cool. Um, 
he's concerned about something called the society of intimacy. So what this means in his book is basically that everybody's dumping themselves into the internet and kind of not really holding anything back and then also sort of surrounding themselves with information that they're interested in. So this is where he kind of gets his idea that the internet is playing into a sort of narcissism of our society. People get, uh, in his world, people are more alone through digital communication, not because they're isolated, but because they're actually hyper-communicating with each other. They're just being bombarded with each other's ideas and personalities. And he's, um, other things, he's really skeptical of the, this totalization of surveillance. He thinks everyone's watching everyone or controlling everyone. He kind of sees it as a sort of a, a totalization of a panopticon, so to speak. And he thinks community is impossible because of this. Everybody's just kind of similar, almost kind of like a uh, Pariser's filter bubble, but sort of a self-imposed one that people are creating for themselves. Uh, how might these theories uh, affect autistics? Um, when it comes to Chulhan's ideas about people dumping themselves into the internet, expressing themselves, we think this might be actually a good thing for them because it allows them to have a voice to describe themselves and express themselves that counters the dominant narrative that controls what they are represented as. They, they might not have as much of a say in how they're represented as they would like to. Um, as far as the filter bubble, we know from research that autistics are spreading new ideas about themselves on the internet. <laughs> But are these alternative conceptions of aut autism that they're offering about themselves, are they encountering a filter bubble? Are they stopping at their own kind of preaching to the choir sort of situation? A uh, couple notes about autism spectrum disorder. It's defined by social communication impairment and restricted interests or behaviors. And these conditions can exist on a spectrum, on a scale of intensity from person to person. So. That definition is usually referred to uh, as the medical model. So the medical model is the predominant view of autism, and it defines autism as deficits and impairments, uh, treats it like a disease. They want to find a cure for it, so to speak. They want to eliminate all the behavioral abnormalities of autistics, and it's the, the kind of dominating view in all the media and autism research that's out there. The, the counter voice to the medical model is neurodiversity. So neurodiversity, um, often expressed by autistic people themselves, accepts and celebrates autism as a valuable part of human diversity. So it flips the deficits into just differences between people, um, talks about how society contributes to the definition of disability, labeling, like putting it on them from the outside. Uh, it's, for them, it's an essentialist identity. It doesn't need a cure. It's part of who they are. It's part of their core way of being. And uh, autistic people are learning about neurodiversity from each other on the internet. So that's an important thing to remember. Some of the sites where they congregate, Autism, Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, we're going to talk about YouTube. Um, so is it a tool to challenge mainstream conceptions of autism or is it going to encounter a uh, filter bubble? Um, it's the largest video sharing site, has a lot of communication options, um, and uh, the idea would be that it transcends topical or geographic boundaries. But um, the concerns, like again, maybe traditional power dynamics might be limiting people's voices. Big voices stay big. Smaller voices don't have as much of a comp competitive factor. What we're worried about is people just mainly seeking their own interests, being narcissistic, so to speak, or the filter bubble, which um, is kind of worse because people have a lot less control over that. Um, our questions, are autistic people using YouTube to share alternative viewpoints about autism? We know that they learn about neurodiversity online, but do they use YouTube to spread that information in particular? And um, are these alternative conceptions encountering filter bubbles? Sorry if I'm going too fast. I'm trying to meet the time. Um, so here are some study methods. We, uh, we did a little experiment. 400 YouTube videos about autism were collected using uh, keywords about autism. And then we coded those videos into four categories according to the uploader's relation to autism. So they could have been an autistic individual, a family member, part of an autism organization, or a media or news video. Um, we took the four newest comments 
from the 25 highest ranked videos and they were coded for whether the commenter might be identified as an autistic individual, a family member, a professional in the field around autism, or something else. And then we, uh, we established reliability on a more detailed coding scheme about how autism was represented in the videos for 82 of those videos. And then um, we're going to report the complete findings from the comment coding and the preliminary findings about the video content from the 82 videos. Okay, so the fun stuff. The video coding, um, what they're sharing about themselves online. So videos in which autistics are addressing the audience tend to represent autism very differently than videos in which non-autistics are addressing the audience in a bunch of key ways. So they're less likely to depict autism as only affecting children and males. Um, a lot of times when autism is talked about in society, you see a child or you see a male. That's not happening with videos that are uh, uh, made by autistics. They're more likely to depict autistics as being ahead of the norm. They champion their differences. Um, they're uh, actually celebrating them as something that gives them a, uh, a benefit or that, that it's a benefit to society. They're more likely to describe autism as essentialist um, instead of it being something that's kind of tacked on or a limitation to their person. It's a, it's a part of their being. They're less likely to uh, depict the available supports as positive. So the stuff society has to offer them to try to help them, they don't necessarily see it as great as videos that, uh, that non-artistics are addressing the audience. They're more likely to depict a need for change in society to adapt to them instead of the other way around. They uh, are more likely to talk about dating this is an interesting one because a lot of times there's a stereotype of autistics not being interested in romantic relationships, but they are and they talk about it. And they're less likely to talk about the negative effects of autism on others. Oftentimes uh, autistics are labeled as being a burden on society, breaking up a family, being something that people have to deal with. Um, they don't talk about themselves that much. Why, why would anyone? Um, so they're more likely to con okay, so this is whether or not they're receiving alternative oh wait, did I skip a thing? No, I did okay. So autistic people are more likely to comment on videos about autism than family members. So we know that it's an attractive medium for them. They are using it and they're using it to communicate with each other through these videos. But we found evidence of a filter bubble in these YouTube videos in which the autistic people are really more likely to comment on videos that are produced by other autistics. And family members are more likely to comment on videos that are created by other families of autistics. Um, in their own videos, I guess this just kind of talks about uh, how they differ um, in the way they describe themselves to the way that society talks about them. So they talk about themselves as being ahead of the norm. They champion the ben their benefits to themselves or society from their symptoms, as they might put it. Typically, autism is often seen as a series of deficits, so they're countering that with their videos. Uh, they talk about dating and relationships, like I said before. This is countering to the stereotype of them not being interested in these relationships. And they're less likely to talk about the negative effects on others. Why would they uh, talk about themselves as being a burden? Okay. So Byung-Chul Han, he's worried about everybody publicizing themselves. We see this as actually a profound benefit for autistics. They need a platform. They have a dominant narrative that they need to counter. And uh, this is something that we actually think would benefit them uh, instead of being something that just makes them worse off. As far as the society of intimacy, uh, the idea that everybody's just encountering their own interests, uh, autistic people need a place where they can go online and learn about the stuff they want to learn about and have more control instead of the kinds of things that society is trying to push on them to try to learn. Uh, Byung-Chul Han's idea that community is not possible because everybody's kind of in their own world. Well, we see that autistics are forming communities on places like Twitter and all these other websites and uh, that they're connecting through the neurodiversity movement in particular on, uh, on other sites. The evidence of the filter bubble, it is disturbing. Uh, those that are interacting with the YouTube videos about autism are really likely to have a s similar relationship to the people that are creating the content. So we think that these new ideas are hard to spread. The, the takeaway from this is that the, the filter bubbles are going to make it difficult for marginalized groups, at least in this case, probably others, to cut through you know, dominant narratives this, uh, of uh, their identities and lived experiences. And that's it. I think I made it.
All right, that was picture perfect because we now have about 20 minutes we're gonna have for Q&A. So I'm gonna let you know we actually hooked up a mic over here. What we're gonna do is I'm gonna come be the uh, sort of uh, game show host with the mic and come over here. And you're gonna have to come down and just not reach all the way up. And what we'll do is we'll just sort of do the ask, the handoff, and we'll keep it that way. I do ask for people to ask questions. Remember, ask a question. Uh, and this is, if you have things from your research or something from your perspective, that's really interesting too, but that might be best saved for after everybody's done, or if you can quickly get to your question. But please do keep it to questions, all right? So I'm gonna come up the front, and then just come on down. Let's make sure this works, eh? Hello, hello, that does work. All right, let me get this out of your way. All right, you can come on up. Yeah, sorry, we're seeking brave souls. It's okay, make sure we can just slack we got here. There you go, right. Hi, my question's for the second presentation. Um, I understand it's a provocation in some ways, um, but I was wondering if it's worth, I mean, you're kind of targeting this hypothetical future. You're thinking, you kind of, the target of it was the overreaching disabled person. I was wondering if it's worth thinking about the companies that are going to be benefiting off of um, trying to market uh, high-end dis uh, prosthetics. And it's worth bringing into question the militarization that's creating disabled people. Yeah, I was expecting that question in a bit of a different form, like it's still the rich disabled people, right? I mean, it, 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 the world we know is not going away in a way. I mean, it, it, will, it will probably, it's worth postulating what types of industries would still be in play. But I think that the interesting thing here that we didn't think about until now is how uh, those new transgressive technologies are actually um, because people want to market them, to put them on the market, but it's still ethically problematic. So they, they use this channel of, we're helping the disabled people now, we're gonna enable the disabled. This is just for medical research. So de facto, this is gonna be, it's gonna end up in the market, but it's gonna be first with this group of people and what that means, yeah. Oh, so, so it's it's a kind of washing those technologies through, I think through medical uh, through medical technologies in order to have them in the market. But I think yeah, it's the same kind of companies. It's uh, transhuman movements that are that are pushing those technologies, but through the medical market first. Yeah. All right. Next. Um, yeah, we'll do a little dosy. Yeah, right. This better be a great question. Um, <laughs> Hi, so thank you for this. This uh, is directed at all of you. Um, and the, pit, the question that's kind of in my head is this notion of religious cyborgs, right? Because we have a long history of clothing mostly as a form of religious mediation, but also as a signal of identity of what kind of religiosity you imbibe. And I think this also goes to neurodiverse approaches because there's a lot of work being done on what sorts of religious mediation is happening there. So... I guess my question is, how might we think of a cyborg, especially where we think of modernity and digital methods as like anathema to religious interactions? Um, how might we put those things into conversation with each other, like religion and cyborgs? Okay. So I could see definitely um, the idea that uh, clothing um, and sort of embodiment is a big part of uh, religious expression in a lot of cases. Um, and I think that in a certain sense, there's you could look at um, sort of from a heady perspective, right? The idea of um, trying to access the ineffable um, as something that is a part of sort of trying to reach uh, beyond the sort of like reaching toward the post-human, right? I think that that's probably, I'm assuming why they put me on this panel. But um, <laughs> the idea that we're, uh, that we're trying to um, sort of access and self better in some way uh, via the sort of um, the non-material world though is, is something that I think differentiates it a little bit from typical sort of cyborg discourses that I've seen that talk more about the material sort of body and um, technology interaction. So I'm not sure. <laughs> can, I, can 
I try to answer that? The, the last words on the Cyborg Manifesto of Donna Haraway is, uh, I'd rather be a cyborg than a goddess. So she contrasts those two to begin with. And I think, you know, from, from my perspective, they're not a contrast anymore because if you're reaching for the post-human, then you're reaching towards the worlds of the gods. So, so the goddess and the cyborg might end up being quite the same in a way. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so kind of piggybacking on you, I do not find them mutually exclusive in any way, shape, or form, like, at all. Um, and particularly because, I mean, like, for me, a cyborg is one aspect of me as an individual, so, like, my religiosity is another aspect, and that all of these things play across my self-definition, um, and figuring out how they work together and how the dialectic between them, like, works itself out is how I develop myself as an individual, <laughs> as a person at all. So, so yeah, <laughs> that answered it, right? Anybody else? Any more All right, great. Thank you. Anybody else have a question? Yeah, you want to come up with something? Yes, yeah, if you'd like to. Yeah, sure, sorry. I know we have some others. We've got plenty of time to give, so no worries. Here you go. Uh, so this question is for the second panelist, but also Minka, you could probably speak to this as well. Um, so on the note of cyborgs, um, you were talking about some technologies that can enhance the senses, like sight and uh, your ability to feel and to walk. Um, what do you consider that technologies for sort of optional abilities, like a, a cell phone, a smartphone, would be considered within the scope of being a cyborg, since so many of us have these things now and they are intrinsic to, to who we are um, or really anything else that isn't naturally part of being a human like access to the internet. It's actually an excellent question that's connected to something you said, the things that are, that are embedded in the body, embodied or, or we use it outside and I think we have a kind of a body panic. When it's inside our body, we feel, oh, I'm a cyborg. But when we use it, we, we, we feel it's normal. And, uh, and this is, th I think it comes from a kind of a body panic because uh, uh, Neil Harbison's company, uh, one of the technologies that they market now is a, f a kind of a compass chip. You can put it in your leg and then you know <coughs> your direction all the time. It's like a compass. Now, what's the difference between having this compass chip in your leg and having a compass on your iPhone? Oh, so suddenly you're a cyborg. So this is this really the the um, th this is really an interesting question, and I think it's the discourse is about bodily practice because we have a body panic. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think my my glasses example that I tried to use, I don't think I actually explained very well. But one of the aspects that I was trying to bring out about that was that pre-glasses, I would have just not been able to see very well. And nobody would have considered that necessarily like, I mean, I would just be somebody who couldn't see very well and had to go closer to things to figure out what they are. But now we consider it as like, I cannot function without the ability to see at a base level. I think in the same way for social engagement, the idea of saying that my social engagement through like my cell phone or internet-based mediating technologies, that that is optional is really dangerous because obviously it's not optional. Um, if I wanna be a social person in whatever social group I'm in and I don't wanna be home alone all night every weekend being miserable, I need these technologies to engage in a proper social way. So. I think that that definition is constantly changing and the idea of what is the natural or the baseline or the norm adjusts as we redefine how we engage with each other and with the world around us. Oh, here we go. Oh, you knew that was gonna happen. All right, I saw somebody's hand over here. Yeah, come on up. Hi, uh, thank you all for your presentations. Uh, they were amazing. I, I have a question for you, Minka. Uh, I was, I, I really love the idea of flipping and using feminism to define cyborg, but I was a bit confused from your last slide because it seemed to indicate that you're uh, asking us to redefine 21st century 
feminism is cyberism which i'm fascinated by but i didn't see exactly how does that connect to the idea of using feminism as a as a reverse engineering of cyber i, I, I don't know if i made my question clear I mean, I think for me, in the way that I both like titled the talk and um, also that final slide, it's it's about a, a continuity. So um, for me, if you are a 21st century feminist, you are also inherently a c cyborg theorist, cyborgist, <laughs> um, that if you can understand gender on this level of fluidities, then you can understand any kind of aspect of how we define our identity on that same level of fluidity. So this is where that should come from, I think is where I was trying to go with that. Not so much to redefine 21st century feminism, but to say that it is situated within an understanding of one aspect of identity, the understanding of these other aspects of identity, one of which might be cyborgs. And then I'll head over here. Okay. Hey. <clears throat> this question is for Dave Shane Smith. Um, at the end of your talk, you kind of wrapped up some things about um, uh, Parser and uh, Byun Chul Han. And I couldn't quite, I, th I think you were saying that um, uh, Han's uh, idea that community is impossible is sort of. Um, doesn't coincide with what your observations with the autism community is that correct that was what I was trying to imply. okay now are you saying that are you are you pr uh, offering the autism community as like a sort of damning counterexample or are you are you saying that it's a really interesting novel community I guess the way that I, like my reading of Byung-Chul Han's uh, ideas about community in his book, uh, were that he he kind of looks at um, the web as kind of dismantling the way that we've socialized and had culture for almost a century. And that community for him, as he talks about it, is this, uh, uh, this, this place that happens because people withhold stuff from each other and they're able to sort of be a person and then another person when they're with each other. And that's where community comes from for him and for other people that he cites in his book. Uh, with, uh, when he talks about community, he seems to, he's a very hyperbolic writer and he likes to sort of say, all of this is gone now because the internet has destroyed it. Um, but with the autistics online, they, uh, they, this is a group that really needs a community. So they're, they're really passionate about using it as a community, and I, and and it seems to me like they're they're kind of giving us evidence that um, maybe there's a new kind of community that can be looked at this way, where they're not, where we can see some hope or something. In contrast to what he was saying, does that make sense? Okay. Great. I know we had some questions over here too. Uh, this is for Dave and Morgan and Anne Marie. Uh, it's a question about community and how, like, at this point, like, past community message boards and, like, blog rolls, that stuff's gone. And now we have YouTube and Twitter and, like, people following each other. But as people who are not originally members of, like, either the fundamentalist Christian community or the autistic community, like, how do you find your way into these communities? Or is it really mostly just, like, following person to person from like comments and following lists or are there hubs and um, do you see like slack channels like private slack channels is like the way of the future for that stuff um, our research was mostly um, following hashtags and we do a lot of that on social media um, and sort of there was sort of a moment where we had mentioned that um, we we're going to mention that hashtags are the sort of um, native way of focusing on how these things are shared and following who is sharing them and what, how. And then there's also kind of a non-native way of following the distortive patterns in the images and how they appear as they're screenshotted and then shared on other platforms. And so in that, there's sort of like 
you lose the connection through the hashtag and through the native sharing platform. But um, overall, what we were really doing was following um, hashtags, searching, and also dropping images into Google's reverse image search. Um, so then so we weren't actually finding what you had asked about. And I'd also like to add that um, I think that probably most people in this room have participated in terms in something sort of like a prayer post in terms of like when somebody's saying like something bad has happened to me or a family member um, I'm really worried about them or whatever and then my response or somebody that I know's response typically is something like thinking of you sending good vibes whatever a comment that's sort of meant to show support but also in this sort of spiritual from a distance sort of way um, so I think that we kind of know how we're not it's not quite the same as being um, outside of um, a specific religious community um, in terms of looking at the practice of this. It's kind of a social thing that goes beyond that. And I think um, it's also different than from being outside of the sort of neurodiverse community community and looking at those videos and not being somebody who practice. I, I think it's not quite the same, but yeah. I have a, one of my co-authors actually wrote a paper on yeah, you want to you want to you want to talk about how they might find your diversity communities online? You want to sure, for a moment? Yeah. Here. <laughs> how they get there? Here. So I didn't necessarily write a paper on how people find neurodiversity online. We're not actually sure, but um, autistic self advocates have actually played a big role in a lot of these communities. So if you guys have read Steve Silberman's book Neuro Tribes, he argues that autistic people are at the forefront of a lot of the creation of all of these online sites, in particular sites like Wrong Planet, the Autism Self-Advocacy Network. These are sites where autistic people are creating communities to advocate and to educate others. And the, each of the communities seem to have different types of aims. So like Wrong Planet is quite in some, sometimes a little bit wary of people coming into their community because it's supposed to be a community, an alternative community. While YouTube, the people who are posting there are really trying to educate other people outside of their community. So there's different types of neurodiverse communities online with different aims. I think that was great. All right, we have time for one more question. If there's anybody in the audience that wants to ask one last dying burning. Yes, come on up and we got, and this will be the end of our panel. So there seems to be kind of like this split on the panel. This is a question of the whole panel. Um, you're all talking about sort of like post-human identity, right? But on the cyborg side of things, these are identities that are at the intersection of like what humans, you know, a point that a human being might arrive at on their own, plus what somebody has sold them, right? On like the religious or the neurodiverse side of things, it's more like, you know, we're not calling these cyborgs, but you're still ending up in, in like a very different space than like the mainstream like like human nature there's still something that makes it different so my question is is there a unifying abstraction that we can maybe be referring to all of these things with rather you, you know like there's this bifurcation and it seems like an arbitrary distinction that you know is there something there um well i i would say that the arbit that the unifier is the cyborg um <laughs> But because for me, I don't see why a cyborg has to be defined as something that's sold like that. That's completely anathema. It's it is simply just that point at which like the organic and the technological are always coming together and the, the technological doesn't have to be sold. There was um, an earlier question about corporations that create prosthetics. And I was just in a talk in the other room um, on the last session time. We we're talking about like 3D printing of prosthetics because we can and we will and like there's always like DIY approaches and ground up approaches and you can make your own algorithms to sort your own email and no one has to sell you that algorithm and it's just as much a part of your prioritization in your own brain so like um, the technologies that we create out of ourselves to then assist ourselves as well as the technologies that we buy from others they're um, yeah I mean that's Uh, I guess off the top of my head, um, the one overlap I guess I would see would that be that the uh, the neurodiversity community is coming from a place where they're at least labeled 
disabled, uh, disabled. Um, the cyborgs are starting out with some sort of form of, or at least the ones they've talked about, are starting out with a form of a, of a disability, a physical disability of some kind, and then they're counteracting it with the technology. And the, the neurodiversity movement is online, so if you take this broader idea of cyborgism as being something that we use, and the internet is you helping them communicate and form their identity and their community through the internet, so that's a form of cyborgism too. So they're, they're pretty parallel, I think, in a way. So I'm, I'm joining David in this, uh, remember the spectrum I talked about of how a human is a very particular set of abilities and then everything we discuss is even, uh, is a bit less, so how do they deal with it? Or achieve, aspiring for more? So, so I think the spectrum, this is what post-humanity means now that we're dealing with the spectrum all of a sudden because for years and years all we cared about is being a better human. What is a human? And now we start looking both ways the above and, and the below and how do they interact. So I think this is what unites this panel, this continuum of, of humanity that st we start opening up. Thanks. Um, I also would like to see, like discuss maybe how uh, these communities exist and how they define authority within the communities and there's the concept of vernacular authority and that, um, especially with neurodiversity, I was thinking of about the way that um, saying that we are not but really with uh, the disabilities as well, saying that we're not uh, bad, we're different and we have different abilities and that these, this comes from an ability to network and an ability to share those ideas and also uh, no longer necessarily look at institutionalized authority. Um, and I think in some point that these communities are online, uh, there's that point of contact again that um, with devices, like you were saying, having a device in you or with you, but you're still contacting that device somewhat in a physical sense. Yeah, um, I would like to add that, so um, I guess we could look at it as um, t the use of tools of mediation with your environment. So mediating um, co contact between you and other people, but also you and higher powers. Um, and I wanted to sort of note at the end that there's an interesting aspect of like the subject and the object commingling in this sort of way uh, that is happening with particularly with the religious um, use of the internet but I think also you can definitely look at how the subject and object commingle right um, in terms of cyborg so that might be a more sort of broad way of looking at those things um, that broadens it out to all sorts of different conversations. <laughs> all right let's give our panelists one more round of applause. All right, y'all, you got about 13 more minutes till the next session begins. Go get some drinks, chill out a little bit, and get ready for session three.